I'm speaking tonight on the subject, where are the dead and what are the dead doing now? This is another uh, subject and another uh, truth in the Word of God that is abused and misunderstood and uh, church people do not agree on it. There are varied and sundry ideas about it. But as I've said many times, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible, and the best place to find answers to Bible questions is in the Bible. And so tonight we will. Now don't you turn to this verse, I'm using it as a text. And as it is appointed unto man that wants to die and after death the judgment, so also was Christ offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him he shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Now that's Hebrews 9.27. Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed unto man wants to die. Now, you can jump the Bible, forget the Bible, but graveyards and tombstone cutters and casket makers and undertakers certainly testify that men die. Is that right? Say it. Now, since we're in the world and we didn't choose to come here, and there's no way to get out, no man ever got out of this earth alive, except Enoch and Elijah, and that was for a reason. But you have a date with death and you have a date with the undertakers, and since that's true, it is perfectly legitimate to attempt to learn everything we can about death and what happens the instant a person dies. Now, the Apostle Paul is the minister to the Gentiles. He was separated from his mother's womb, according to his own testimony, and separated under the gospel of the great God. And he said, when God called me, he said, I conferred not with flesh and blood. He didn't go into Jerusalem and get permission from the apostles, but he preached what God Almighty revealed to him. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we read verse 1. For we know the Bible is a book of positives, not a book of, ex uh, not a book of question marks, but a book of exclamation points. The Bible speaks in positive language. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now, watch as we read. For in this we groan earnestly desiring to be cold upon with our house which is from heaven, if so be that being cold we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do grow, being burdened not for that we would be uncold, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the self same thing is God, who also hath given us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, now watch this. Therefore, because of what he has just said, because of the truths just stated, we are always what? Say it for me. We're always confident. We are always confident. In other words, Paul said, my confidence, our confidence is unshakable. We are always confident, knowing, not thinking, not supposing, not hoping, but knowing that while we are at home in the what? While we are at home in the body. So the body is not us. The body is the home of the spirit and the soul. The body is the house, the tabernacle. But the body is not us. Now, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we won't by faith and not by sight. Now here's that word again. We are what? Say it confident. We are confident. We are confident. I say, and willing. We're willing, Paul said, to be absent from the what? Absent from the body and present with whom? Say it. With the Lord. Now, I don't see to save my life why anybody should be confused about what happens to a believer when they depart this life. Now, here's the reason I make that statement. Beloved, I'm a Baptist preacher, and I love the Baptist church, and I believe in true, pure Baptist doctrine. But I'm not preaching for the Baptists, and I'm not trying to prove Baptist doctrine, and I'm not trying to build up a Baptist church. I'm preaching the gospel of the grace of God, I preach all of the gospel, I study and rightly divide the word of truth, I refuse to wrongly 
divide the word of truth to prove anything. One of these uh, persons that I had an unpleasant discussion with in the prayer room Sunday night after the service said that Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I said, that's true, and I'll discuss that Wednesday night. Do he said that? I said the Bible also said Judas went out and hanged himself, and in another place it says, go and do thou likewise, and I suggested to that friend that this community might be better off if they would. You don't like that, do you? You don't like that, do you? You didn't know that the Apostle Paul said concerning the Judaizers, that gang that came to Galatia and were mixing law and grace, Paul said, I wish ye were cut off. That means I wish the last one of you were dead. Now you get mad with God. I didn't write that, I just read it. We got too many sissies in the church today. First class jellyfish. You read it, brother. Paul said, I wish they were cut off to trouble you. Didn't he say it, preachers? Didn't he say it? That's strong language. But that's Bible language. Now then, the Bible teaches clearly through the pen, the inspired pen, of the minister to the Gentiles, we are confident, we are willing to be absent from the body and present with sin to the Lord. Now, without hesitation, without reservation, without fear, I make this statement boldly. The split second that a believer dies before their eyelids are closed, their spirit is with the Lord. In spite of what you've heard, what you've read, or what has been said. All right? No time element. Look at Philippians chapter 1. It's just over a few pages. Philippians 1. And in Philippians 1, 21, Paul says, inspired of course, For to me to live is Christ. To die is what? Payday, gain, profit. I'm waiting now. And I see the other page is turning, and I want you to keep turning and find the place. I'm reading now verse 22. Philippians 1, 22. For to me to live is Christ that I have gained, but if I live in the flesh, so the flesh wasn't Paul, he lived in his flesh. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I want not, for I am in a strait betwixt two. Now watch this very closely. Having a desire to depart and get in the grave. Talk to me. Having a desire to depart and go to sleep. Having a desire to depart and do what? Say it. Be with Christ. Now is Jesus in the grave? Is Jesus in a casket? Is Jesus unconscious? Is Jesus asleep? Then I say, my friend, on the authority of Philippians 1, 22, and, uh, yeah, well, 23, verse 23, I say on the authority of Philippians 1, 23, the split second that a born-again, blood-washed, believing child of God departs this life, they are instantaneously with Jesus in paradise. Paul said, I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart, to be with Christ, which is far better. Would you say it is far better to be in the grave than it is to be here? How many of you folks would rather be dead than in the grave here tonight? Raise your hand. I'll see if I can appoint somebody to knock you in the head, all right, if that's what you want. Of course, we might get in trouble, but we'll try to accommodate you. If that's what you want, I tell you frankly, I don't want to die. You say, huh? I don't want to die. I'm not afraid to die, but I don't want to die. That's always the funny thing to me. Some of these uh, folks, you know, that are so homesick for heaven. 
they jump about three feet off of the ground and click their heels together and say, Hallelujah! Amen! I'm so homesick for heaven! The funny thing to me, when they get a bad pain around the heart, they call the doctor. If you're homesick, instead of calling a doctor, God bless you, pray for another pain! I'm not homesick. I'm pretty well satisfied right here. Amen. And I want to be sure my mansion's ready when I get there. Amen. And I don't want to run ahead of schedule. I'm ready to go when God's ready for me. But I don't want to get there ahead of time. Do you say? Now, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And Paul said, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. So certainly, we couldn't say to get in the grave, get in a casket, die, would be better. Not at all. Now then, in the third place, I want you to turn to Matthew 17, and I'm going to read just a few verses there. Then we'll get in our main scripture. Matthew 17. Here we have the account of the transfiguration of the Lord Jesus. I want to read it to you. Matthew chapter 17 and verse 1. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up to a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white and glistening, and behold, there appeared unto him, saith. Now don't be afraid to say it, the booger man's here tonight, but we're bigger than he is in Jesus. Amen. Say, preacher, who are you calling the booger man? I don't know if your phone's ring and answer it. Amen. I just dial the number. You're looking at a Baptist preacher that don't have but one face. If I had another, I'd wear it. God may have a lot of things marked down against me, but I'm not a back scratching, ear tickling, compromising, gospel dodging, chin digging. Jellyfish, stinking hypocrite. Amen. What I am, I'll say it, and you'll know it, and I won't put any frills on it. I'll give it to you in the rough. I'm a double first cousin to Peter. When they were taking his Lord away, and he yanked out that sword and cut off an ear. He wasn't cutting at big toes, mister. He was hitting for brains. And if Jesus hadn't said, put that sword up, he'd have got some brains the next quack. I've always claimed kin to Peter. Amen. I'd rather be kin to him than some folks I've met on earth today. Amen. Huh? Peter never did sneak around in the back alley, God bless you, in the dark and sneak in and pass out literature. He just told you what he was. Amen? Say, huh? I picked them all out now. I was trying to find the last and They told me how many were here. And I found it just then. Amen. Thank you. I got every one of them spotted now. I know which way to find. You don't kid me. You don't kid me, brother. I didn't start doing this yesterday nor the day before either. I've been doing this 28 years. That's a quarter of a century plus three years. And I've learned a lot of things the hard way. And I know where you're sitting. I know who you are. So you don't fool me. Now we'll continue. In chapter 17, we read, And there appeared unto him, say that name again, what is it? You ever hear him? If you ever heard of him, raise your hand. You ever hear Moses? Put that in the pot. All right, take your hand out. Somebody else appeared. What's his name? Tell me. Elijah, did you ever hear him? He did say amen. Did you? All right. Now then, this is hundreds and hundreds of years after Moses and Elijah had died, and they appeared to Jesus, and they appeared with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah. Now then, I read that simply to show you that if Romans 2.11 is truth, and it is, if Romans 2.11 is truth, then if God is no respecter of persons, if God let Moses and Elijah ascend in the paradise and ascend their conscience knowing and with the capability of moving and seeing and speaking, 
if God is no respecter of persons, then God has permitted every other faith that has died to remain conscious and to appear in the glory of Jesus Christ. God is no respecter of persons. Amen. Now turn to Luke 16. Well, you say, now, Brother Green, you're going to that parable of the rich man Dives. No. No. I'm not going to the parable of the rich man and Dives. Dives is not in there to begin with. Rich man is. And this is not a parable, and I'll give you this tent and everything that goes with it if you'll prove to me that it is. And sign every bit of it over to you tomorrow morning. That bunch that comes to your door and tells you that, what well, now you say, Brother Green, in my Bible, right up above it, it says the parable of the rich man died, he gets you another Bible. That's not in the Schofield Bible. And don't you ever forget those little notes that are put in there by man, not inspired. The, the titles of chapters and, and notes are not inspired, brother. That's put there by men. Amen? Say I don't care what you say about parables. Turn to Matthew 13 right quick. Matthew chapter 13 right quick. The only way in the world to understand the Bible is to compare Scripture with Scripture. Spiritual things are spiritual things. All right. Now, in Matthew chapter 13, we find that Jesus, same day, verse 1, went out to the seaside, and uh, they gathered to him. I'm just talking. Now, verse 3, Matthew 13, 3, and he spake many things unto them in what? Say it. Parables, saying, Behold, so and so and so and so. Now then, look at verse 24 in the same chapter. Another what? Say it. Say it out loud, beloved. Another what? All right, in verse 31, read it. Another what? Verse 33, read it again. Another what? All right, turn to, to Luke chapter 12 right quick now. Just a few pages from where we were a moment ago. Luke chapter 12, and let's see what we have there. In Luke chapter 12, we find in verse 16, Luke 12, 16, and he spake a saith. And he spake a what? All right, now then look at Luke at 16 and verse 19. Luke 16 and verse 19. And we read, there was a certain rich man, which was cold and profile and fair so good, and there was a certain beggar named what? Lazarus. Now you look up here at me right quick. Look this way. If this is not, a literal account of a rich man and a beggar named Lazarus, this scripture is misleading. If I tell you that I live in Greenville, South Carolina, and on one side of me there lives a millionaire, and on the other side of me there lives a beggar named Sam Brown, and you come to Greenville and you don't find a millionaire on one side and a beggar on the other named Sam Brown, then I lied to you. Either there was a man named Lazarus laid at a rich man's gate and uh, begged for crumbs, or this is a lie. Because there's a personal name, and a little bit later, Abraham is named, and certainly Abraham was a Bible character. Amen, say. So if this rich man didn't talk to Abraham, this is a lie. Because the scripture says he did talk to Abraham. If I tell you that I talked to Lyndon Johnson and I haven't and don't care to. Say, what are you, a Republican? No, I'm still Baptist. Some of you look like Democrats now. Amen. You really do. You look almost as bad as that other crowd I've been talking about tonight. If I tell you that I talked to Lyndon Johnson and I've never talked to Lyndon Johnson and you go to the president and say, President, did you talk to Oliver Green? So I don't even know the man. Never met him. Don't know a thing about him. I, I never talked to Oliver Green. Then I lied. Now watch this very closely. 
There was a certain rich man clothed purple fine linen, and he, he fed sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus, laid his gates full of sores, and his eyes be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the pallbearers and put in the grave, and that was the last of it. Huh? Well, let's read it right. What do you say? And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into what? Abraham's bosom. When I say, Mr. Green, I know your little speech by heart. That's all you do know what you've memorized. The preacher you're talking about, I'm talking about that soul sleep crowd. That water salvation crowd, all in the name of heaven, they knows what they've memorized. They don't know a thing about this book. You take their Bibles, and all you can find underlined is verses about water and soul sleep. That's all you can find. They don't underline anything else. Let a Jehovah's Witness come to your door. Let a Jehovah's Witness come to your door. He won't underline John 3, 16, Acts 16, 31, Romans 10, 9, and 10, John 5, 3, 4. You'll never find one of those verses underlined. But he underlines everything in the Bible to prove his point. All right. I know what you're saying. How did they, how did they get, how on earth, preacher, did the angels get Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham the same way the little babe rests on the bosom of the mother? Amen. The babe is referred to as resting in mother's bosom. And you know it and I know it and everybody else knows it. And the only people, the only people that cannot see the truth of this scripture is the group that's trying to prove a religion. They're married to a religion. They're not concerned about the truth. They're trying to prove their point. And they study the Bible to prove their point. I'm not trying to prove anything. I'm preaching the word of God. So the angels didn't carry him to the grave. The angels carried him to Abram's bosom. Amen. Answer. Now read on. And the rich man right in the middle of the verse. Verse 22. The last part of the verse. The rich man also what? Said. Died and was what? Well, they buried him. Doesn't say a thing about him burying Lazarus. I'll guarantee you the dogs finished him off. And what the dogs couldn't finish, the garbage collectors got and put in the city dump. But that doesn't make any difference, brother, if the dogs did finish him, and if the garbage collectors did get his bones, bless God, that didn't matter. His spirit was already resting in the bosom of Abraham. Amen, huh? And what they do in this body, I hope I'll have a decent funeral, and I want a decent funeral, and I don't want to be dumped on a garbage heap, but if I am dumped on a garbage heap, that doesn't make any difference. Before this body's cold, I'll be resting, praise God, in the presence of Jesus and the angels with the rest of the saints. Hallelujah. And when I'm dead, if you come to Greenville to my funeral, don't stand over my casket and shed crocodile tears and boo-hoo and squall and say, poor old preacher Green, I'll be going down Hallelujah Avenue 90 miles an hour kicking up gold up. <laughs> hey, hey, man, just going down the golden street. Come up over the casket of a saint and squall and say, poor old mother, poor old mother. She wouldn't trade places with you. And if she could come back, she wouldn't come back. Amen. Say. Now, the Bible says the rich man died and they buried him. Now, I'll guarantee you, they had about three trios, two quartets, and six preachers. You let some bird die that cussed the church and cussed the preachers and damned everybody that tries to live right and sold liquor all his life but given a lot of money to charity and let that old buzzard die. They'll have about seven preachers on the platform to preach this too. Amen. Reminds me of the old boy that died down in Greenville. He beat his wife and half killed her and cussed her and kicked her and she had blue knots all over and little children were Afraid of him, come home drunk and throw him out the window. And he died. 
And they shaved him, gave him a haircut, and put him on a white shirt and tie, and boxed him up, and closed him up, and locked him up, and made him go somewhere after his dad wouldn't go in his life. They ought to pass a law in the state of Pennsylvania if a man don't go to church when he's alive, it ought to be against the law to carry him to church after he's dead. You ought to have mercy on dead folks and not make them go places after they're dead they wouldn't go when they're alive. Well, they say, what you going to do? He preacher, take him out here in one of these bars and hang some Budweiser cans on his casket and let the bar attend the preacher's funeral. Amen. Put the bird in the ground. And if you think that's rough, you ain't not God Almighty get his hands on you. If you think I'm rough, bless God, you wait till God gets his hands on you. Let some old bird get drunk and lay out in the woods drunk and play poker, and some poor little old woman drags five young'uns to Sunday school, dresses the young'uns, works in a plant to feed the young'uns, picks beans and corn to feed the young'uns, and that bird drinks beer and lays out with women, then let that buzzer die, and you put him in a casket and put him before God's sacred death, and have a preacher to read the script to him. It ought to be against the law to do it. It's a disgrace to God's house. So I'll never come back to hear that bird again. That's all right. I crammed one dose down your throat that you needed. That old boy down home died. that beat his family half to death. They still scared to death of him. And they died. And they put him in the casket to him church. And the poor preacher didn't know what to say. They, they carried him to church and uh, all the community was there. And, and, and the preacher stood up to preach his funeral. And he said, brothers and sisters, he said, this community has lost another one of our great citizens. And we're all going to miss him. And he carried on for about five minutes. And he said, that dear little wife sitting down there. She's going to miss it. All those kisses and caresses and goodbyes and hello, darling. He said, take those little boys. They're going to miss daddy. All that candy and chewing gum and ice cream, little Johnny and little Jimmy. And Mama stood it as long as she could. She punched the biggest one and said, Junior, Junior, go up and look in the cast and see that's your paw. I think we're at the wrong funeral. Some of you fellows have a mighty sickening look on your face and a funny color on your eyeballs. Could it be that you was out all last weekend stewed on Budweiser, High Life, Red Cup, and the rest of that junk, and you was out all weekend with some ungodly female while your wife stayed home to care of your babies? How huh? could it be? Say, could it? You are lower down than a snake's belly in a wagon truck. You ought to have to sleep with a hog with the apologies of a hog. Amen! Now, the burial. Now watch this. Verse 23, and in what? Say it. And in hell he lifts up his what? Being in what? And see of whom? And who else? Last. Then he began to talk. Now, I know some of you folks have been told that's the grave. I know you have. But I've buried sinners. And this Bible says that this man died and in hell he opened his eyes. And I've buried sinners. I know I have. I've buried men that's been murdered, killed, commit suicide. I'm an evangelist. And when somebody gets killed or dies in Greenville, that's not a member of any church, nine times out of ten, if I'm at home, I get to see it. And I've buried some wicked sinners, but I've never seen one sit up in the casket and open his eyes and start talking. And if he does, instead of the undertaker saying ashes to ashes and dust to dust, I'll be making dust. Amen. <laughs> and if there's any benediction at that funeral, the undertaker will pronounce it, not me. Amen. I'll be gone. Don't you let any lying prophet tell you that the grave is hell. The grave is not hell. The rich man died in hell. He opened his what? Said. And he saw Abraham. And he saw Lazarus. And he said, 
Watch it. And he cried, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and sin Lazarus. He knew him. He'd seen him. He recognized him. And this is not a parable. This is an account, a literal testimony. Sin Lazarus said he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am tormented in this state. You know what a flame is. But Abraham said, now Abraham's talking, so if Abraham didn't say this, this is a lie. If you go out of here tonight and misquote me, you've lied on me. Amen? Answer me. Answer me. Now listen, brother, this doesn't say, as it were, somebody so-and-so. It says Abraham. Uh, Abraham is a Bible character. Amen? Answer me. And if Abraham didn't say this, this is a lie. Abraham said it to the rich man. Abraham said, Son, remember it. If thou in thy lifetime has seen good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but, but, one word, say it, but what? Say it again. When is that? Past tense, present tense, future tense. Tell me. Right now. Right now. He is comforted, and right now you're tormented. Every born-again believing child of God that has died since Jesus Christ went back to heaven. Every believer that's died in this dispensation of grace immediately, instantaneously, in a split second, every believer goes to be with Jesus. And every sinner that's died since, of course, Adam sinned, every sinner that's died is in hell now, and they've been there ever since they died, and they'll be there and stay there till the great white throne does. Then you say, Mr. Green, if saints go to heaven and sinners go to hell, then why the resurrection and why the judgment? I'll tell you. At the close of my sermon, I'll tell you. And give you scripture for All right. Now, Luke 16, 19 and following teaches us clearly, unmistakably, that the righteous go to paradise and the wicked go to hell. And let me say this to you people. If you get the doctors for a few weeks to keep the morphine, the cocaine, the dope, the barbital and all the rest of the pain killing, nerve numbing, body numbing, uh, uh, don't out of dying people. Listen to me if you get the doctors to keep that stuff out of dying men. You can write some books on hell, fire, and they'll be all sinning. If you let sinners die in their natural minds, they'll tell you some things about hell. And some of them tell you in spite of the dope. I wish I had time tonight to tell you a story that I know firsthand. My brother's wife, daddy, begged my brother to pull his feet out of the fire for two hours before he went to hell. Listen, I visited my brother's daddy-in-law 24 hours before he died. He was 89 years old. He'd been as mean as a snake and as crooked as a barrel of fishes. He robbed and stole and cheated and bootlegged all his life. And he was rich. And I visited that old man 24 hours before he died and talked to him and prayed with him. And just before I left, his boy picked up a glass of water, took a quill, put it in the glass, put it in his daddy's mouth. And the poor man had two weeks to even suck water through the quill. He had to take a spoon right his lips. And just before I left, the old man groaned and tried to move his hand, and that boy picked up his limp hand and laid across his chest. Twenty-four hours later, he died, and my brother, who weighs 190 pounds, and four more men sat on him in the bed to keep him from jumping out of the bed and going to hell in the floor. Infidels and atheists and agnostics and haters of God have explained away this Bible to their satisfaction, but they've never explained why some people die in peace while others die in terror and harm. I can tell you why. 
David said, The Lord is my shepherd. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll say no evil. Now, the next scripture. I want you to turn to Luke 23, same book we're in, the 23rd chapter. Luke 23, verse 39, one of the criminals which were hanged with Jesus rail on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself. And that's what the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, we receive the due reward for our deeds, but this man done nothing amiss. Now this is the other thief. And he said unto Jesus, comma, Lord, comma, remember me when thou comest into thy what? Say it. Kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, comma, verily, and that's truly. The word verily in the Greek could be translated truly. Truly or verily, I say unto thee, comma, one word, say it. Say it again. Today, Shalt thou be with whom? Me in what place? In paradise. Now Paul says in this uh, in Second Corinthians, and please don't turn. I'll tell you where it is. In Second Corinthians, Paul said, "I knew a man about fourteen years ago, whether in the flesh or the flesh, I don't know. God knows." But he said, "Such a man was caught up into the third heaven, into what place? Saint Father, paradise." And Paul said he saw things and heard things that are not lawful to utter. Now paradise is God's house. In my Father's house and in the mansion. And when Jesus died, he went to the Father. And he said to the thief on the cross, Today shall, and that's as strong as you can make it. Not, in other words, shall. It's, it's, a, it's a fact, it's positive. There's no doubt about it. Today, today shall thou be with me in paradise. Well, you say, teacher, couldn't that be a question? If you want to insult the intelligence of God Almighty, yes. But if you don't want to insult God, leave it like it is a clear statement. The thief on the cross said, Lord, remember me. And Jesus said, today we'll go to paradise together. Amen. Answer me! And the thief didn't go to the grave. He didn't go to the dirt. He didn't go to the ground. His spirit went to paradise, the same place the spirit of Jesus went when Jesus said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. The thief spirit went to the same place the spirit of Jesus did. It went to paradise. All right, preacher. Is that all? No. Turn to please Revelation 14. Revelation chapter 14. And in this chapter of the last book of the Bible, John, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, exiled to the Isle of Patmos to receive God's last message to man. We read. Revelation 14, 13, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, On the knee, write. And here's what he wrote. What's the first word? Tell me. And that means happy. Happy. Look it up in your Greek lexicon or dictionary. Happy. Happy are the what? But what dead? What dead? Which die in the Lord. Not all dead, but the dead who die in the Lord. From henceforth, that is, from this day forward. Now, in the Old Testament era, death even to a believer was vain. Job said, if a man die, will he live again? Then, of course, he answered it. But in the Old Testament era, every person that died went to the heart of the earth. And Jesus said, I'll give you one sign. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And you certainly wouldn't tell me that Joseph's tomb is in the heart of the earth. Joseph's tomb is in Palestine. And the body of Jesus was put in Joseph's tomb. But the, the, the soul of Jesus descended into hell. Not the far side of hell, the paradise side, where the rich man saw Lazarus. 
When the rich man saw Lazarus, he was in the center of the earth on the paradise side of hell, and the rich man was on the other side of the gulf on that side. And the rich man saw Lazarus. Now, when Jesus descended into the lower parts of the earth, in Ephesians 4, 7, 8, 9, and 10, Jesus, who is he that descended, but he that first ascended? Rather, I have it backwards. Who is he that ascended, but he, first, he who first descended into the lower parts of the earth and led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men? When Jesus Christ arose out of the, of the dead, he brought the saints out of the paradise in the center of the earth. He brought them out and he carried them far above all heavens, that is, to the third heaven in the Father's house. And now, all saints, the Old Testament saints, the New Testament saints, all saints are in the third heaven in paradise, resting and they're happy. Now read the rest of the verse. Blessed are the day in which died the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, capitalized, Holy Spirit, that they may what? Rest from their what? And their what? Their works do follow them. Now, my time is almost gone. It's 20 minutes after 9. And I do my best to let the folks out 9.30 or shortly thereafter. So I'm a third. Now then, here's what we read in the last book of the Bible. Happy are the dead who die in Jesus. They rest, but their labors go on. Now look at me. Will you look this way? Many people who gave money to buy this tent are dead. I could name some, but you wouldn't know them. You may know somebody that gave money on this tent that's dead. In this earth. You may know someone that gave money to bring this tent here that's dead. Are you listening? Every saint of God that gave a dime, a nickel, a penny, or a dollar, or a hundred dollars on this tent, if they're dead, they're resting, but their works are going on and will continue to go on as long as I live and as long as every person saved under this canvas lives, because every person saved under this canvas, every person that gave money on this tent has a part in the conversion of that soul. When a preacher stands up and tells you that I had a hundred people saved, mark him down vain and empty. He don't know what he's talking about. Only God knows how many people have prayed for the souls that have been saved here. And every person that contributes to the salvation of the soul will share in the reward for that soul. Now, if I drop dead tonight, if I drop dead tonight, God could not be just and reward me tonight for my labor. Because every person that's been saved under my ministry and this equipment would still be used. And I was used to the Lord to raise the money to buy the equipment. And my work will go on until the church is complete, the rapture takes place. Then we'll all be caught up to meet Jesus in the clouds in the air. We'll sit down at the marriage supper table in the sky and we'll be rewarded for our stewardship. And that's the reason for the resurrection. Paradise is a place of rest. And all the righteous are rested. When I say, preachers, do you think you know what you're doing? Turn to Luke 15. And I want to read you some, mis some often misquoted scriptures. Luke 15. Luke 15. Hurry, please. It's thundering. And the watch is running too. The preacher's not afraid of a little thunder, are you? No, I'm not. No, I'm certainly not. I have a little faith. And I have sense enough to dismiss a crowd when a storm comes in a tent. This is false, brother, not making you see it. And I don't want you to get hurt. And if I can help it, you're not going to get hurt under this tent. If I've already, we've lost three of these things in the last 28 years, and I don't want you under here. All right. In Luke 15, we read, we have a threefold parable. And in verse 7, I say unto you, this is Luke 15, 7, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. 
Now that says there'll be joy in heaven. Amen. Now watch it, beloved. Listen, this Bible is a book made up of words, and, and we need to watch every word regardless of how little or big it is. I tell you that likewise, joy shall be in heaven. Joy shall be in heaven. It doesn't say who's rejoicing. But it says there'll be joy in heaven over one sinner that repents, more than 99 just persons which be no sinners. Now, he gives us the parable of a woman looking for a coin, and she searches till she finds it, and then she calls her friends, and they rejoice. Now in verse 10, likewise, that is in the same fashion, after the same fashion, I say unto you, there is joy, there is joy, where? Read it. And we stand up and quote, the angels rejoice over one sinner. You can't find that in the Bible, save your neck. It doesn't say the angels rejoice, it says there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels. And will you look this way, please? Will you look this way? There's nobody on earth that can know the joy of a sinner being saved, but another sinner and the Savior that saves them. Angels can't rejoice over sinners being saved because angels have never been lost and been saved. Angels are created righteous. They've always been righteous, except those that left their first estate there in saved. And an angel can't rejoice over a boy being saved because an angel don't know what it means to be saved. They are ministering spirits to the heirs of salvation. And if you want to know who it is rejoicing, it is the saint rejoicing in the presence of the angel. Then he said, Teacher, what kind of body do, does our loved ones have? Now, the time's run out, so now is where I have to give it to you peacefully, and if you want the references, I'll be glad to furnish them. Now, listen. What kind of a body do they have? Are they just a spirit floating around? No. In Mary Magdalene, out of whom Jesus cast seven demons, Came to the tomb, found the stone rolled away, and she saw a man, and she thought the man was what person tell me? Darkness. So he must have been a real man to look like a man, appear like a man. And she thought he was the gardener. He must have been a man, not an angel, right? Talk to me. If he'd had wings and been in shining attire, attire, and his face had been shining, she wouldn't have thought he was the gardener. Amen. Answer me. And Mary went to him and said, uh, where have you carried my Lord? Where's my Lord? And, and he called her name and she said, uh, Rabboni, and she said, uh, my Jesus, my Jesus, my Savior. And she started to take hold of him and Jesus said, don't touch me yet, don't touch me yet. I haven't ascended to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. Amen. Answer me. Then just a few minutes later, he appeared to the fellows or to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus and they put their hands on him. Right? Answer me. Now then, Jesus had a body, but he didn't have the body that he had when he returned from the Father. Now, we, when we die, we will not be uh, a, a spirit floating around. I believe we'll have a body just like Jesus had when he came out of the tomb. But we will not receive our glorified eternal body until we see him. Behold, what man of all the Father has bestowed upon us, and that we should be called sons of God, therefore, the world knows for not because it will not beloved. Now are we the sons of God, but it does not yet appear what we should be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like. So when the rapture takes place, and the bodies that have gone back to the dust are raised, and the spirits of the righteous unite with the bodies raised, and we who are alive are changed, we will receive a body just like his glorious body, that he appeared to the disciples in the room with the doors closed, and he said, I'm not a ghost, I'm not a spirit, do you have anything to eat? And they said, boy, I taste the honeycomb, and he ate in their presence, and he said, handle me, I'm not a spirit. Amen, thanks. Now look at me. Spiritualism is of the devil, and you cannot communicate with the devil. But some way, somehow, I believe, it is announced in paradise when a mother's son receives Jesus for whom she prays many years. I don't know how, that's none of my business, but how could they be rejoicing? How could they be rejoicing over a sinner saved if they didn't know the sinner got saved? You see it, say, do you see it, huh? There is rejoicing in the presence of the angels. It couldn't be anybody but the saints. And Jesus, and God the Father. 
Who else could rejoice in the presence of the angels? If I if I stand here and shout in your presence, you're not shouting, I'm shouting. If you shout in my presence, I'm not shouting, you're shouting in my presence. If we're shouting together, it doesn't say that it's rejoicing with the angels. It stands in the presence of the angels. Amen. Answer me. And I believe that when a mother's son or daughter is saved, and she prayed for them for years, and she's in paradise resting, some way it is announced. And she calls her friends together like the woman called her neighbors together when she found their coin. And to have a hallelujah time. Amen. I tell you, that's wonderful. Praise God. Amen. All right. Now, there is so much more that we could talk about. So much more I'd like to talk about. The time has run out. Preacher, you didn't tell us why. The wicked are raised. I'm going to enclose and turn to Revelation 20. Right now it's 9.30. It'll only take me about five minutes to do this. And then we'll go. All right, now in Revelation chapter 20, we find in verse 4, I saw thrones and they were sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. And which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their forehead or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ how long? A thousand years. Now that's the righteous dead, but the rest of the dead, the wicked dead, the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. The wicked dead are raised a thousand years after the righteous dead. There's no such thing as a general resurrection. When you quote that little creed, I believe in the general resurrection, you're quoting false doctrine. There's no such thing as a general resurrection. The righteous dead are raised, and the wicked dead are raised 1,000 years later. It's right here as plain as the nose on your face in the mirror. And some of you folks that read your Bible and stop letting the doctor do all the reading, you get along better. All in the world, some of you folks know about the Word of God, what's done preacher clams down your throat. You read more funny papers, watch more television, and go fishing more than you read the Word of God. And you talk about the general resurrection and the general judgment. There's no general resurrection. There's no general judgment. It's not in the Bible. It's true that all that in the grave shall come forth. But it also says in the previous verse, all that hear my voice. And it's been twenty uh, two thousand years, 20 centuries, and that hour, that one hour, is still going on. Now, there's a thousand years between the resurrection of the godly and the ungodly. At the rapture of the church, and it can take place tonight, it can take place in the next 60 seconds. Two in one bed, one taking one left, two in the field, one taking one left, two grinding, one taking one left. Behold, I come as a thief in the night. And when Jesus comes, he do says from heaven to shout the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ are raised first. The dead in Christ. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Then 1,000 years later, the wicked dead are raised, and here's what happens. Now watch it. Verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, and whose face the earth and the heaven fed away, and there was no place found for them. Now watch it. And I saw the dead. D-E-A-D, not dead in Christ, but dead too. I saw the dead small they stand for God, and the books were open. Books, B-O-O-K-S, books. God knows everything you've ever done, said, or thought. Everything you've ever said, done, or thought, God has it down, brother. God knows the number of the hair in your head. Books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the B W O K S book. Amen. Say, according to their what? Say, and the sea gave up the dead, and death and hell delivered up the dead. Hell is a temporary penitentiary, a place where the wicked are housed until. The second resurrection of the wicked, that is, after the first resurrection, the next one, the wicked. 
Now, don't you go out and say that all of the things that hell is going to cease to be. Hell, as we know hell today, will cease to be, but hell will be cast into the lake of fire that burns with brimstone. Read on. The secret of this, this the death and hell lived into which in them. And they were judged every what? Say it. Every man according to their what? Say it. Works. And death and hell were cast into what place? Say it. Lake of fire, this is the second death. And he said it's not found written in the book of life. It's cast in the lake of fire. Is that right? Amen? Now then, let me tell you why if the righteous go to paradise instantaneously and if the wicked go to hell instantaneously, then why the resurrection and why the judgment? Listen, friends. Sinner or saint, you'll receive from the hand of God Almighty exactly what's coming to you, no more, no less. If you think we're going to depart this life and go to heaven and everybody stands sterilized in heaven, you're just ignorant of God's word. You just don't know the Bible. Every saint that has been a good steward, they that be wise, and who is wise? He that wins souls is wise. They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Right? Amen. Say But the man who hid his talent, that which he had was taken from him. Now Paul said, there's one foundation, men build on this foundation, gold, silver, precious, stone, wood, hair, stubble. Every man's works to be made manifest, the nature of the time shall be revealed by fire. Every man's works to be fired by fire of what sort? S-O-R-T, sort. It is. If any man's work abide, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work be burned, he shall suffer loss, but himself shall be saved, but so as by fire. Now, what will it be to go to heaven without a reward? I don't know, but there'll be folks there without a reward. But I don't want to go into heaven to be saved. I want some trophies to lay at his feet. I believe we're taking up another offer in the prayer room. Amen. I want to see that when the babies are taken away. Amen. Now, will you please look this way and get quiet just a minute and look at me? This is a, this is a serious moment. I can't feel the devil anything he can to distract me. 